Um, I would like to welcome everybody who has spared time uh, to come and join us for uh, this session. IP is a very interesting subject. I believe those who have given their time will benefit from this. Uh, very thankful to the ELS Secretariat, uh, particularly the chair of the cluster, Mr. Sanden Damkova, Gabriel Achaya, the IT officer for organizing this. Uh, also thank the panelists for giving their time to join us. I know being a Friday uh, for most of our people, we're, going, we're not going to keep you here. Uh, I'd like to do this very, very fast, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, uh, finish in time. Uh, for those uh, who uh, would like to uh, uh, refer to this uh, panel discussion, I'd just like to inform you that it is being recorded and you can be able to get it at a later time from uh, the Secretariat, Gabriel Achaye, or the IT officer there, they'll be able to share it. Uh, do ask your questions in the inbox, I'll be able to take them, but we shall have a Q&A session and also commentary. Uh, I'll go straight to the introductions. Uh, I'll start with uh, uh, introducing the chair of the cluster. We have three presenters, but uh, we have as well the chair of the cluster, Mr. Sunday. Godfrey Indamgova, who has very wide experience in uh, intellectual property. He is the chair of the IP cluster of uh, the East Africa Law Society, works with ABC attorneys, highly specialized in IP technology uh, in Dar es Salaam and uh, Zanzibar. Uh, I'm very happy they chose a competent person whom I've worked with for over 10 years now in the IP field, and uh, I'm certain he has glided this cluster and the subject to another level. Uh, the last time we had the hassle uh, handling the IP policy in East Africa under the ESC. I'm not sure whether they did it. I last uh, had the subject about three years ago, but we shall be able to hear about it in uh, the course of the discussion. Uh, we have also uh, three other presenters, uh, two are online, Peter Kea from Kenya is uh, still uh, uh, stuck with the commitment, but he will join us and be able to share with us uh, some of his uh, 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 experiences. Uh, online is Lilian Nantume from Uganda. Uh, she'll be able to share a presentation. Uh, do take note and uh, make uh, the, the, the questions, prepare your questions for her. Uh, ask her to give a brief introduction about herself, and then we'll go to Jean Claude, and then we'll start the presentation. Lillian, could you please introduce yourself to the, uh, the, 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 the East Africa Law Society? Uh, thank you so much, Edwin. Um, my name is Lillian Dantume Muiro. I'm the founder and the managing director of Grooming a Successful Woman with Intellectual Mind. We are based in Kampala. And I'm also a director at Daily Investments Limited. We deal in different businesses. And Lillian is also an expert in intellectual property. I also work with WIPO on women empowerment. Yeah, that's what I do. I do empower women in different communities uh, with the intellectual property. Yeah, that's what I do. And that's why okay. I am. Thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, Glad to hear you from you. I uh, would be very glad to hear your experiences working with SMEs, especially those women who are involved in the SMEs. And I'm glad that you've worked with WIPO and uh, ready to share your experiences. Uh, Jean Claude Shimimana is from uh -huh. ENS Africa. Uh, uh -huh. Jean Claude uh, will be able to share his brief bio before we go to the next presenter. Uh, thank you, Edwin, uh, for the invite and uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I'm Jean-Claude Shimimana. I'm an associate at ENS Africa Rwanda. I'm routinely engaged in intellectual property practice here at the firm. I do a prosecution of local trademark matters, including uh, conducting searching analysis and analyzing uh, search results. Uh, assist with trademark filing and daily management of trademark-related matters. 
I also do uh, company registration, incorporation, uh, real estate transaction, uh, including convincing, of course. I do also conduct regulatory review update for compliance, uh, prepare legal opinions. I do uh, specialize generally in corporate commercial and regulatory compliance, uh, in, uh, in, uh, intellectual property uh, inclusive. I do hold a bachelor degree from the University of Rwanda, and I hold also a postgraduate diploma uh, from the Institute of uh, Legal Practice in Rwanda. I work with ENS Africa, uh, which is the Africa's largest law firm, uh, with many offices across the African continent, Rwanda being one of them. Um, we have more than 600 practitioners uh, working across the African continent, and we do assist uh, uh, local and multinational clients uh, operating across the African continent. Uh, it's a pleasure being here, and um, I would be happy to share the experiences with um, IP as far as uh, the, the flourishing of SMEs in East Africa, in particular Rwanda, is concerned. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Jean Claude Shimimana. Uh, we're happy to have a representative from Rwanda. Uh, Peter Kea, a brief introduction yourself to the members of ELF. Uh, thank you very much. Indeed, it is always a pleasure to meet people from the greater East African community and also to engage, especially on matters IP. Uh, briefly, my name is Peter Kea. I'm an advocate. I uh, invest in Kenya, Nairobi. I'm at the firm of Kibunge and Company. Uh, my passion is actually on uh, fintech, but I also do commercial and corporate law. I have a master's uh, of law at the, from the University of Nairobi, and my bachelor's of law is uh, from Moi University. I'm also a certified mediator. Uh, I'm also an arbitrator, and I'm also a corporation secretary. I also work for the government. <laughs> I think that is that should do for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now that we know every panelist, uh, I'll make a very brief introduction of myself, the moderator, Edwin Tavaro from Uganda, an advocate practicing for 15 years, uh, particularly in the areas of uh, commercial law, dispute resolution, uh, IP and technology particularly is what KTA specializes in. And uh, I'm happy that uh, we're all here. I also once sat on the East Africa Law Society Governing Council 2017-2018. And uh, I'm happy to see it has come to this great length and uh, pushing the IP agenda to the top so that we can have it as, a, uh, as a, uh, an area of interest. It's a very highly emerging area for everybody particularly it's convergence with technology and I'm happy that uh, uh, my land friend uh, Sandy has taken it this level. Uh, thankfully, we're done with the introductions. Um, I'll ask Lillian Nantume to make her presentation first. Uh, then we'll have Jean-Claude in Shimimana and then uh, Peter Keya. Uh, we are ably represented by from all countries, I think it's just South Sudan, Congo, and Burundi. But I represent the South Sudan. Maybe Jean Claude will represent uh, the Congo. <laughs> Lillian will represent uh, yeah. Burundi. <laughs> yes, but uh, Lillian, please go ahead with your discussion. Am I able to share the screen? Sure, sure, you are. Thank and the you. IT, IT is on board to help us. So hopefully you are able to see the screen. Uh, Edwin, are you able to see the screen? Yes, we are able to see the screen. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Yes, uh, I've already introduced myself, but this is who I am. Lilian Nantume, I'm the Managing Director at GISWIM. Um, GISWIM is an empowerment organization in Uganda and as we do empower women to grow their businesses using intellectual property. So I'm an IP expert and I work with a division for the least developed countries, WIPO, 
I hold a master's degree in intellectual property, then also another master's degree in uh, business administration, and also have a bachelor's in business administration. So that's who I am. And I'm going to be sharing a brief on the policy and reg regulatory issues in using intellectual property to support SME's growth in East Africa. Because for me, um, using intellectual property to grow businesses or to support SMEs grow, this is a cup of coffee to me because this is the work I do daily uh, to make sure that people do understand what intellectual property is and the value of intellectual property to their growth. And the key points to look at uh, the status of small and medium enterprises in East Africa. Then also I'll talk about uh, the policy and regulatory IP framework on how they can support SMEs in East Africa to grow into successful uh, businesses. Then in other words, uh, how can we use intellectual property? So for me, this is how I understood uh, the, the, um, the topic. How can we use intellectual property policies and uh, regulatory frameworks to support the growth of SMEs in East Africa? So for, to start with, uh, I think uh, as uh, practitioners of intellectual property, there are three questions we have to ask ourselves. Do SMEs we want to support through our IP frameworks and policies understand what intellectual property is? Do they even know what they own when it comes to intellectual property rights? Are they practicing intellectual property at the end of the day in their businesses before we even start thinking of supporting them to grow? Do they understand the term intellectual property? Do they understand the concepts of intellectual property and the value of intellectual property before we go into the, the IP frameworks and the policies? Because for me, I think we, if we start talking about the policies and the IP frame, frameworks for SMEs, it might be a bit uh, complicated because Intellectual property is a bit technical, and we all know that. So I think the first thing to start with is for them to understand what intellectual property is before we take them into how we can support or how we can help them protect their intellectual property rights through the different through the intellectual property frameworks or legal frameworks. Uh, so uh, my question of how whether the SMEs understand intellectual property well. I, I wanted to share with you the status we have uh, in East Africa about SMEs. Uh, currently, I have a project I'm running or managing uh, on uh, intellectual property for branding and product development, women entrepreneurs in Uganda. So my experience with our SMEs is that uh, uh, we are supposed to go, when we started this project, we are supposed to go out in communities to make sure that we do identify all small enterprises and the medium enterprises who are not using intellectual property. Then after we support them to register intellectual, to register their trademarks. So this is all about the, the, the project which is currently running in Uganda for WIPO, Division of the List of Other Countries, URSB, and this way. So what I, I, I discovered in the, in the, in the field is that uh, many people are doing business. As you see here, the small enterprises, what we call the small enterprises. Because uh, for SMEs, we have what we call the small, those ones who are still small, and those ones who are into medium enterprises. So for the small enterprises, you find that uh, these people are earning, uh, just doing business. They don't have a goal in their business, in their businesses. For them, they only wake up to go and do business to earn those small profits. And if I may give you an example in the picture here, uh, this is Elise K. The lady is called Liz. So she's one of the women entrepreneurs on the project. Uh, when we met her, she was doing her business, her small business in the community. She, uh, she had never heard of intellectual property. She didn't know all about intellectual property, but then we recruited her on the project and we started mentoring her on how she can use intellectual property to grow her businesses. Then after she had acquired intellectual property, this is the after now, after she had acquired intellectual property, she was able to improve on her business. She was able to register her brand as Ellis K. She was even able to expand on her business from a canteen, a small canteen, to now a bigger shop where she's now operating as a fashion designer. 
And if you look at her products, I think they are far better than how she was. She was. They are far better, better, better than how she was before she had incorporated intellectual property. So what am I saying here is that uh, before we even think of uh, implementing the policies and the IP, um, uh, the IP frameworks, let's also think of whether these people do understand what intellectual property is and the value of intellectual property. If we can go to the, the medium, the businesses we call the medium enterprises. Yeah, we can give you uh, uh, so uh, this is uh, living. And uh, the one on the, um, I think on my left, the, the, the wine bottles. And this lady, we met her also in the community. She was falling under the medium enterprises. She was operating her business well. And for her, she thought that was the best way she could operate her business. Those were the best products she could bring in the market. But when we started mentoring her, we discovered that uh, this lady was doing her business well, but uh, the way she was packaging her wine, some of the bottles were big, others were small, as you could see. Even the covers were of different colors, meaning she wasn't consistent in what she was producing. Why? Because they didn't know, she didn't have knowledge on intellectual property. She had never heard of intellectual property. And even the research we tried to carry out, to carry out during the, the, the mentorship program, we still discovered that uh, these people had never gotten even a chance while they were still at the university to learn about intellectual property. At least uh, for Edwin, because I heard that you come from Uganda, you know very well that uh, for those who get an opportunity to learn intellectual property, only learn it at least, it's only the lawyers, and I think you only get the basics of intellectual property. Then others like us who have gotten a chance it was uh, either through WIPO or ARIPO or the African University, where we became experts, where we, we got an opportunity to become experts in intellectual property through uh, the African University. But in Uganda right now, we don't have that opportunity of learning intellectual property on our curriculum. So people just go and start doing businesses, not knowing that uh, there is what we call intellectual property, which can help them to bring better products in the market, which can help them to grow their businesses for better profits. So after we, we started mentoring Liban, she now started producing better products in the market. As you see, even before the name she was using was called Liban Act. It wasn't a registered trademark. By the time we started registering, she lost the name to Liban. So now her brand is Liban. So this is after she had started incorporating intellectual property. And now if you look at the, the bottles of the wines, they are far better than before she had incorporated intellectual property. So this is what I'm trying to say, that before we even start thinking of how we can help them protect through the legal frameworks, do they understand what they are going to protect? Do they understand how they are going to use intellectual property? Do they understand the benefits of intellectual property. Uh, secondly, my other question was, do these people know what they own when it comes to intellectual property rights? Uh, if you look at the different pictures here I have, uh, these are also for our women entrepreneurs, because uh, we have 70 women entrepreneurs on the project whom we have mentored into intellectual property. And all these women, we are coming from the community. These are the women who knew nothing when it comes to intellectual property. So it has been a process. We have taken them through different stages of how to better their products, how to better their businesses using intellectual property. But now the question comes, do they know what they own? Yes, they have come up with better products. But if you look at this bottle of wine or the jelly this side, do they know the different intellectual property assets they are supposed to utilize to make sure that they benefit out of uh, the, the work they have created or they have innovated in the market. So uh, as practitioners, as advocates, let's use the intellectual property frameworks. Let's make sure that the policies we have in place do, do guide us to support these people through creating awareness for them to first understand the different concepts of intellectual property before even thinking of how we can, how they can 
be able to benefit or how we can protect them through the legal frameworks. Uh, my other question we have to ask ourselves before we, we think of supporting SMEs grow their businesses through the, the, the policies and the legal frameworks, uh, do they incorporate IP in their businesses when they are uh, producing or when they are manufacturing the different products? Do they put intellectual property into consideration as they bring these products into the market? Because myself, I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm a, I'm a fashion designer. I have a fashion house, a fashion line. It's called Delhi Fashion Line. So uh, I always encourage people and I always set myself aside as an example for these women so that they can learn from me that as you, you start producing, as you bring a product in the market, always make sure that you know the different concepts of intellectual property. Incorporate them so that at the end of the day, you have one product we call the tangible product. But within the tangible product, we have what we call the intangible, the different intellectual property assets, which you can also utilize and make money out of them. So we have to go back on the ground to make sure that as we support these SMEs to grow using intellectual property through our legal frameworks, we simplify IP for them. We try to make them understand how they can benefit out of intellectual property, the value of intellectual property as they produce these products in the market so that it also quickens their growth. It also increases on, their, on the profits that they are making in the, in the market. So in summation of what I've talked about, uh, I have, I'm thinking that uh, the best way to use intellectual property in support of the growth of SMEs in East Africa through policies and regulatory frameworks. And may, we may think of sensitizing these SMEs about IP and its value to their business growth from the start. The people we think, or the SMEs we think that are, they are still small, let's go out and look out for them so that as they start their businesses, they get to understand how they are going to be using intellectual property. They get to understand the value of intellectual property so that they can grow within intellectual property to make their businesses better. Then also we have to consider their thoughts as we, at all levels as we draft these policies and IP frameworks. Because at the end of the day, these policies and the different IP laws are to protect the SMEs. So if we don't get their thoughts, then it's like we are putting IP at the high end, yet it's also supposed to protect these small businesses or the small enterprises who are growing or who are going to become big tomorrow. Then also let's try to simplify the IP policies and the regulatory frameworks for these SMEs to understand. Remember the only language SMEs understand is money. So if they understand money, let's speak IP as money. Because for me, I believe intellectual property is money. Intellectual property is business. And for me, this is how I look at intellectual property. Every time I keep thinking, I keep creating, and I, I believe everything is possible because now I have intellectual property in me. So let's try to, to simplify intellectual property. Let's try to, to speak intellectual property in monetary terms when it comes to SMEs so that they can understand what intellectual property is and how they can benefit out of intellectual property through the different frameworks or the IP laws that we have. Then uh, let's create awareness about the existence of these policies and IP frameworks. I think it's very important because as of today, you might, you might find out that it's only 1% of the Ugandans, or even in East Africa, of the SMEs who know that uh, the IP laws do exist, only 1%. So let's always make sure that uh, these people do understand that uh, the intellectual property policies, the legal frameworks, intellectual property laws are in existence and they are there to support them. But if they don't know, then it will be hard for us, even the practitioners and the advocates, to go out and start convincing them on using intellectual property for their growth. Then uh, through the intellectual property uh, regulatory frameworks, we should always make sure that the set fees for registration are friendly. 
take an example of the SMEs I've talked of, of uh, the pictures I've shared of the women deep in communities who also want to engage into intellectual property. But this woman is looking at a net, uh, a net uh, turnover of uh, about uh, $200. And now for you, all the, the frameworks are talking over $100 to register a trademark. How do you think, or how do you expect such a woman to get interested in registering a trademark of $100? Yes, you can be able to make only $200 at the end of the year. So let's also reconsider the registration fees so that we can attract as many SMEs into using intellectual property for their growth. Then now uh, also looking at uh, the advocates, the practitioners, the lawyers who are into intellectual property, please try to make sure that you also try to, see, to, to attract many SMEs into using intellectual property. How? By making your fees or your charges friendly to them. Because if you overcharge these people, what you are doing is to turn them away from intellectual property, but not attracting, not attracting them into intellectual property. Currently, we have registered 70 women entrepreneurs on the project. We have supported them to register their trademark. We have made it possible for them. And they're also now encouraging. In fact, now it's the train the trainer approach. They are the one now who are fishing other women to come on board to register their trademarks because we made, we made sure that we do it at a friendly cost. So make sure that if in case you are to attract these SMEs into using intellectual property through our different laws, put your fees at a cheaper cost so that as many SMEs can get attracted into intellectual property, they can start speaking intellectual property, they can start also advocating for intellectual property. Because at the end of the day, this is the way to go as East Africans. If we want to grow, we have to look into using intellectual property. Because intellectual property is money. Intellectual property is knowledge. Intellectual property is everything. So for us to grow, for us to innovate, for us to compete with the developed countries, we have to support, we have to create awareness, we have to sensitize our SMEs, we have to simplify these technical terms of intellectual property to people to understand people who are into business. Because for them, the language they want to hear is money, not the theory. Money, where do I benefit from? And that's how we are going to help them grow using intellectual property. Thank you so much, Asante Sana. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Lillian. I think that was really amazing. Very, very exhaustive. I can see you have both the legal knowledge and industry knowledge. First of all, as an IP owner, a promoter, and someone with the legal knowledge is the best would have uh, at this point. Um, I see people raising their hands, but um, excuse me, we, we just hold on a bit. So we need presentation from everybody else, and then we'll have a Q and A thereafter. Uh, Salma Sadiq and Eva Mudondo, I have noted your uh, your hand. I'll get to you later. Um, Jean Claude Shimana, could you please uh, um, uh, give us the IP view in terms of policy from Rwanda? First of all, does the country have a policy? How is it being affected? I'm certain Lillian has gone through a few things, but uh, from what I see, awareness, enforcement, affordability, and the relevance to the business. Kindly share your views from Rwanda. Uh, thank you, Edwin, and thank you, Lillian, for the presentation I've given, and thank you for the great work you are doing uh, for supporting SMEs to recognize the value of IP and getting their trademarks uh, registered. Uh, let me go ahead and share uh, my presentations. Uh, hope everyone is seeing my screen. Jean-Claude, we confirm we are seeing the screen.
Okay. Uh, as the topic of today goes, uh, we are uh, talking about uh, policy and regulatory issues in using IP to support SMEs growth uh, in East Africa. I personally, I will uh, particularly uh, address how uh, the existing policy and uh, regulations in Rwanda are affecting SMEs growth uh, in Rwanda. I will give uh, an overview of the existing regulatory from framework, uh, what Rwanda has tried to accomplish in assisting the SMEs, uh, as well as uh, give challenges and the, recommend the recommendations uh, after elaborating on the challenges. As I said, I work with ENS Africa, uh, which is the African Africa's largest law firm. Uh, of course, ENS Africa is one, one of those offices ENS Africa has across the African continent. We do have uh, offices in Mauritius, South Africa, Uganda, Namibia, Ghana, and Kenya. And we do assist multinational clients operating uh, the African uh, continent. Uh, going ahead to give uh, to clarify what we call SMEs, because uh, uh, really, and didn't, though he talked about uh, SMEs, he didn't um, uh, clarify who are those SMEs. Uh, so, according to the Rwandan Entrepreneurship Development Policy, uh, for it, it classifies SMEs. Uh, uh, I mean, small and medium enterprises as startups. Uh, they classify them as such because there is no international definition for SMEs and uh, enterprise, enterprise size uh, is defined um, in different ways from country to country and from context to context. Uh, so for, for, for Rwanda, they classify them basing on the number of employees they, they employ and the number of uh, the annual turnover they are able to reach. So they uh, define a micro startup as an early stage company, which has been in existence for less than three years uh, and trying to solve uh, a, a given problem using uh, technology or an innovative uh, solution. Uh, and employing from one employee to two employees and having a uh, less turnover, I mean, a turnover less than 1 million. That is approximately uh, 1,000 uh, USD. Uh, whereas a uh, small startup, uh, the, 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 the early stage company, which employs uh, three to 20 people uh, with annual turnover, uh, uh, more than 1 million, but not exceeding 20 million. That is uh, approximately 20,000 uh, USD. Uh, whereas uh, medium startup, it's um, an early stage company employing between uh, 21 uh, to 100 employees with annual sales or annual turnover ranging between uh, 20 million, 100 francs to 500 million, 100 francs. That is uh, uh, for the sake of clarity, at the moment, uh, one one thousand one hundred francs equals to one thousand. I mean, one dollar uh, equals to one thousand and hundred one hundred francs. So here we can say it's equally uh, to 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 the value of the the Rwandan currency. So I would say that uh, for medium startup, at uh, the turnover should be. Uh, in the range between uh, 20 to 500,000 USD. Whereas a uh, large startup, uh, of course, is also another stage company uh, employing more than 100 employees uh, with uh, annual sales or annual turnover, more than 500 uh, million, 100 francs, that is uh, approximately uh, 500,000 uh, USD. Uh, uh, moving from uh, defining what is uh, an SME, which I, I have classified as um, a startup, uh, I'm going to give an overview of the Rwandan uh, legal framework 
Uh, Rwanda has operational IPRO, uh, which is in, uh, in operation since 2009. Though at the moment it's under review, many things are being uh, considered uh, based on the challenges which have been identified uh, in this law, uh, including the harmonization of the law with the, the IP agreements uh, signed uh, and international conventions accessed by Rwanda and addressing some uh, few uh, issues uh, which have been uh, identified when uh, during the implementation of this IP law. We do also have uh, operation seeds and plant variety law. This one uh, helps those who are in creativity or of breeding uh, plants. Uh, of course, plant breeders, they are granted uh, plant breeders uh, right protection and, and the, the office in charge is um, RICA, Rwanda Competition and, uh, and Inspection Authority. We do also have protection of cultural heritage. We have also operational regulations on importation of uh, electronic communi communication equipment. Uh, and Rwanda, of course, has uh, assessed most of international IP convention, including patent cooperation treaty, Madrid protocol, uh, World Trade Organization uh, on agreement, uh, trade related aspects of intellectual property, that's TRIPS agreement. And we do also have, uh, of course, a policy on intellectual property, a revised policy on intellectual property, which dates uh, uh, October to, to 18. We do also have a Rwanda Entrepreneurship Development Policy, which is in support of uh, SMEs. Uh, Rwanda has registered uh, success in regard to uh, supporting SMEs with the, the IP, uh, though at the moment, the, as I said, the IP law is uh, under review. There is a draft depending the parliament uh, for their approval. Uh, among the things to be addressed in this draft, uh, Rwanda, as it tries to, 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 to create an investment hub uh, across the African continent uh, through Chigari International Finance Center. Uh, it is also contemplating to start uh, registering patents for pharmaceuticals because there is an increase of uh, investors who are in uh, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. So uh, through TRIPS agreement exception, Rwanda is contemplating to uh, grant those investors uh, the, the, the protection of their, their patent as far as the pharmaceutical products created are concerned. Uh, of course, this IP law pro, uh, provides for uh, collective management societies where uh, certain individuals in certain industry come together to, uh, to, 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 to defend uh, their creation, the rights resulting from their creations. Uh, we do have um, association of authors, we do have association of uh, cinema artists, we do uh, also have uh, association of those who do other aspects of arts like uh, photography. Uh, Gwanda conducts um, regular IP awareness through RDB, RDB is Rwanda Development Board, an office in charge of uh, protecting um, intellectual property, and of course, patents, uh, utility model, trademarks, among other things. So uh, when you try to see the results of this IP awareness is that uh, when you browse through uh, the, the RDB IP journal, which is a journal uh, uh, containing the trademarks uh, registered, uh, the trademarks accepted, and, the, and the, uh, any changes made to re already registered the trademarks like assignment, change of address. So you, you see that um, uh, most of those trademarks registered are from companies which don't have the well-known names, uh, which I may call, they are of course the startups. Uh, in Rwanda, we do also have um, various SME targeted initiatives, like uh, 250 startups in incubation program. Uh, this is uh, a program where the funders are called um, 
to be supported uh, with uh, uh, with developing their ideas uh, to turn it into, into commercial uh, a commercial product, and they are provided assistance of uh, accountants and lawyers to help shape um, the, the the related uh, aspects of the, the their products they are developing. We do also have hunger pitch fest. Uh, this is a, a competition put in place by a minister of ICT and innovation uh, in partnership with RDB, that's Rwanda Development Board. Uh, they call all the startups to present their projects to, 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 to the audience. And among those who, who have uh, projects which are promising, they are, they are funded, uh, they are funded uh, from one million, uh, from five million uh, to, to 30 million USD. So this is a good initiative for startups, uh, SM, of course, SMEs in Rwanda. We do also have a Norskin Foundation. Norskin uh, is a, 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 a non-government organization operating in Tigari. They do also help uh, startups uh, with the, the, the capital and knowledge and network they need to turn their creations in, into, into business. Uh, we do also have technology and in, innovation support center it's located in Kigali at Kigali Public Library. This one deals with um, helping uh, the, the founders or the creators uh, uh, to access uh, info, uh, various information uh, concerning patent so that they are they, they, they are stimulated to 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 grow and do some innovation. Um, Rwanda under RDB uh, does a, a deep scrutinization of uh, IP applications. Like they check everything before a trademark or any patent is registered, and this of course helps uh, SMEs uh, the costs related with uh, opposition. And of course, IP cases are handled by specialized court. That is uh, the commercial court. Uh, so far, we have uh, case laws in place, uh, though not uh, diverse. Uh, I mean, the case laws of Rwanda, as far as IP is concerned, haven't been uh, expanded to cover uh, various aspects of uh, intellectual property. Well, Rwanda also uh, applies mandatory certification. This uh, helps to protect the, the infringing uh, goods to be imported in Rwanda to the extent that someone or any person, whether business or a, a, an individual, to import an electronic communication equipment, he has to first obtain a type approval from uh, Rwanda Utilities Regulatory Authority to ensure that that, um, that uh, uh, electronic communication equipment to be imported is in compliance with the set requirements and the standards. And of course, this type of approval is checked when importing. Uh, we do also, I mean, in Rwanda, there is also a regular countrywide uh, regulatory surveillance conducted by the regulators, uh, Rwanda Investigation Bureau, uh, Rwanda Food and Drugs Authority, private sector federation. And of course, uh, there has been results uh, uh, registered uh, through this country and the regulatory surveillance. Uh, for example, of recently uh, on September 26th uh, last year, uh, according to the reports, uh, the National Police said that it is seized from traders counterfeited products of over 76 million Rwandan francs. That is ex uh, approximately uh, 76 um, uh, thousand. USD through Usarama 3, 2022, within three days. Uh, there was also another country wide regulatory surveillance conducted uh, in December 2016, where uh, Rwanda National Police reported that it also seized uh, from traders counterfeited and illicit uh, goods valued at over 140 million Rwanda francs, that is 140,000 uh, USD within, of course, through days, through FAGIA operation. You can imagine if uh, this um, regulatory surveillance uh, are conducted 
on daily basis. Many products, many counterfeited products can be seized uh, from uh, the, the, the traders. Uh, Rwanda also has uh, in place uh, investment incentives. Uh, these are in the current investment code. Uh, for take an example, angel investors, those who invest in startups, uh, that is SMEs, they are exempted from capital gains and withholding tax uh, for dividends. Also, uh, those who establish intellectual property company, uh, the, 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 the company established just to own uh, intellectual property, they are given a, prepar a preferential uh, corporate income tax of 3% on the foreign sourced royalties. Uh, we do also, I mean, one also provides uh, an incentive for film industry investors, those who invest in the film industry, to the extent that they are. They are charged uh, zero percent uh, value added tax for goods and services procured locally, and uh, zero percent for uh, foreign specialized services um, procured uh, abroad. Um, uh, to move to the challenges, um, of course, though Rwanda has done its best in putting in place the the, the regulatory framework uh, enabling the SMEs to flourish. Uh, still, there is an issue of not enough uh, IP awareness. Uh, really, I uh, talked about it, uh, that awareness is needed. Uh, yes, uh, in Rwanda also awareness is needed because most of startups uh, don't know about the existence of IP, don't know about the value of IP, don't know about how IP can be commercialized. So this is uh, a, a challenge existing also in Rwanda to SMEs. There is also centralized IP registry. Our IP registry office is based in Kigali. So anyone who files an IP application, I mean local applications, of course has to take that application to, to the IP registry office in Kigali. So you can imagine someone located um, on the sides of, of the country, like uh, uh, near Congo, or near uh, Tanzania, or near Uganda in the northern province or in the southern province near Burundi, to come to Kigali to, uh, to have uh, is or her intellectual property uh, registered. Uh, there is also an issue, though it may not be considered as issue as such, but it can be an issue based on the fact that the, the startups are not aware of the services being provided by advocates. Uh, when you try to see the, the fees um, provided under the regulation, uh, fixing the scale of fees, put in place by uh, Rwanda Bar Association. Registration of trademark, uh, uh, the fees range from 600,000 Rwandan franc, that is 600 USD, whereas uh, supplemental registration and opposition, um, the fees uh, range uh, from uh, 300,000, that is approximately uh, three, uh, 300 uh, USD. Um, Considering awareness, I mean, in, for the cases relating to IEP, the fees range from 1 million to 100 francs, that is uh, approximately 1,000 uh, 1, USD, uh, plus a 10% on the damages awarded. So these are the, the, the fees uh, being charged at the moment. These fees can be considered as high by uh, any startup because uh, most of them, they don't understand the work being done by the lawyers. But again, this can be uh, negotiated and uh, the lawyers, uh, if approached, would be uh, happy to, to assist uh, the, 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 these startups to get uh, their IP issues or I, uh, trademark registered at a lower cost. Take an example at the farm where we had one client who approached us. Of course, uh, it is a, a tech startup. Uh, he did have money uh, to, to get the assistance he, he wanted, uh, but um, he requested us to have a consideration of, uh, of him in regard to 
the product is about to put it to the market and the, 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 the expected success. Um, and we, we provide the services uh, uh, free of charge, uh, maybe for the, the future opportunities. We provided that assistance to, 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 to this, this uh, uh, FinTech startup. And of course, the, the, the startup uh, is now in operation. So many uh, creators are not aware that uh, lawyers can help them even at the free, uh, I mean, even uh, free of charge, considering their situation. Of course, though there are fees, these fees can, can be negotiated between uh, the parties and uh, uh, most of the lawyers would be happy to uh, assist these startups. Uh, the enforcement uh, issues, though, they, as I said, uh, the regulators try to uh, count, uh, to to detect or prevent a counterfeited product through the programs like Usarama, Fagia, among others. These are not enough. Uh, this, the the SMEs should also participate to do uh, a regulatory market surveillance, where they go to the market to see whether their products are not being infringed, to see whether there is uh, no product. Uh, has been imported, uh, which is infringing uh, their rights. So they should uh, participate in this uh, regulatory market surveillance. Uh, there is another issue that I should uh, put forward, uh, mostly when it comes to goods suspected to be infringing. Rwanda grants uh, two rights to an individual, uh, who I mean the brand owner, who suspects products to be imported to be infringing of his IP rights. Uh, this person has uh, two options to file a case to, to the court that is uh, the commercial court or to, to, to file a request to, to the uh, customs authority requesting the customs authority not to release those goods. But again, there is a cost which is charged that uh, we are the, the brand owner who has suspected goods uh, infringing uh, his uh, his IP rights, uh, he has to deposit a, a security of 20% of the value of goods imported uh, suspected to be infringing. Uh, for the this this security is provided for uh, to, to cover the damages uh, which may uh, result when the, the, the case is handled and the, the infringement is not established. Uh, take an example, if someone was importing uh, products and they are, uh, they, they are detained at the customs authority for like, for like a month, then if they, uh, they are released after that month, he might incur the, the, the losses. So this security is provided to ensure that someone who who submits a request a requesting the freeze of the release into saturation of uh, suspected products, uh, he has to, 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 to make sure that this security is there to cover any related cost which an importer may, may incur. But again, this uh, security uh, is very high considering the size of the startups and, and even the budget constraint they, they, they be facing. You, you can't imagine if someone is importing like a hundred containers of infringed uh, products. So where can this startup manage to get this 20% of the value of those uh, imported products? Of course, this is a, a challenge to, 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 to startups to, 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 to take this way of requesting uh, the, the, the customs authority to, to seize goods uh, uh, and not to release them into such uh, circulation before uh, the, the, the court does examination of whether those goods are really infringing the, 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 the registered IP. Uh, in Rwanda also there is a challenge uh, that there is uh, no series of trademark. Of course, uh, as we all know, startups, when they are developing products, they be changing various things on, on their products. Let's say a uh, trademark, like Someone may write a, a trademark name, but at the end he sees that he has to to change the letters, to change the font, the, font, the color, 
or the description of the product, the service, or the location. Uh, uh, for example, in the UK, Australia, Singapore, and Qatar, among others, uh, they, they, there is a recognition of a uh, series of trademark, where one uh, file one uh, trademark application, and when there is changes to, to that trademark already registered, he doesn't, he is not required to, to file, I mean, to pay additional fees to file a, a, a another application. Instead, he files that application through series of trademark. Um, since this, uh, this, um, this procedure is not recognized in Rwanda, it is, it poses a, a challenge to, to the startups. The startups could also use this procedure to, to register uh, various um, IP, but of course those IP are mini trademarks which are which are similar without incurring um, additional costs in terms of um, official fees. And this of course will save uh, their time uh, official fees and offer them a broader protection from that series of trademark. Again, there is no procedure on uh, recording IP rights with the customs authority, though the customs may assist someone to check whether the products to be imported are not infringing. But again, they don't have uh, any way to, to check uh, whether really those products are not infringing. So if they could have a database uh, of the registered IP, uh, they could use that database in checking uh, whether the products to be imported uh, are, are infringing or not. Uh, there is also another issue of, um, of course, limited creativity by startups. Not all startups uh, are creative. Uh, some of them they, they might tend to, to 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 copy and paste other people's ideas or other people's brands. Like you find the most uh, known brands, uh, I mean, someone with a startup using a name similar to, to the name of the well-known brands. This is not a good practice. Uh, startups should run uh, to develop their brands uh, uh, and put more efforts in getting their brands um, recognized uh, through competition, and through the 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 the, the, the market um, surveys, as I as I said, they have to monitor whether they 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 their IP are not being infringed. So they should have a spirit of uh, cre creativity instead of trying to look someone who has a well established brand and then they go and copy paste. Uh, at the end, when they 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 at the end when they flourish. These people with big brands, when they learn that uh, someone has infringed their IP, of course they will come to them, and of course their operations we 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 end from there without forgetting the the damages they will pay uh, to the to that uh, company with well known brand due to the infringement of the their their, their brand. Uh, so the recommendations that I would give, um, of course, uh, there should be regular IP awareness. Rwanda Bar Association, of course, should also participate uh, in helping the, 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 the community, the Rwandan community, uh, of course, the, the East African community, uh, to know the value of IP, to know about the official fees, to know about the procedure of protecting IP, to know there should be uh, a, a, an IP culture developed among the, the startups, the founders, to know the, 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 the value accorded to, to IP. Of course, the, the, the those students should also uh, participate, uh, mostly those at the university. There is a course they run uh, called uh, Legal Clinic where they go uh, for simulation of what they have uh, studied uh, by uh, helping on pro bono. Uh, the, 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 the local people. So they can also participate in, in this uh, IP awareness to help uh, SMEs to know the value of IP, the procedure of getting the IP protected, uh, you know, and it, to instill the, the spirit of, uh, of, of creativity. 
uh, uh, there is uh, the University of Rwanda, as I uh, uh, have seen that it also has um, an IP policy uh, covering uh, the creations from the, the, the University of Rwanda employees, uh, students, and of course, the, the lecturers. So, uh, and among uh, the, the obligations of the university is that it has to instill uh, the, the, the culture of creativity and the culture of protection of intellectual property among the, the students, the employees, and the staffs of the, the university. This is really good. And of course, it, it should be uh, run on, on a regular basis. They go out, they preach IP uh, knowledge to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, to the SMEs for these SMEs to know the value of IP and how they can use that IP to get their products and, and of course their businesses uh, developed. Uh, as I said, uh, professional fees, on the issue of professional fees, though the startups may consider the professional fees to be high, they should uh, understand that lawyers do also pro bono. They are there to assist uh, the, 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 those who need the, the, the legal assistance. And of course, many lawyers, as um, Lillian has said, can consider a special aid for SMEs, but of course, no, SMEs are not aware of the legal assistance. Anyway, do they know that the lawyer can assist them? How many do go to lawyers to, to seek their assistance? Of course, very few go. So through this uh, recommended regular IP awareness, uh, these uh, SMEs can be also enlightened about approaching the lawyers to get assisted to understand the, 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 the IP, the procedure, the value of IP. Uh, of course, as I have said, uh, the IP registry is um, uh, centralized in Kigali. If there can be uh, a, a decentralized IP registry, like uh, in every region, let's say in every district, they put an office where uh, application may be uh, received from, uh, from SMEs to get their uh, intellectual property uh, protected. It can help uh, these SMEs in terms of avoiding the uh, the costs related to traveling to Kigali to file their IP and the costs related to coming again to Kigali to get the certificates, uh, the, the certificates of registration. Of course, uh, in Rwanda, someone can file an opposition via email. It doesn't require to, to go to the IP registry. And of course, you can also file um, you can also file a, a trademark search uh, via email, and the IP registry can notify you about the, ref the refusal notice uh, again via email. But um, uh, uh, if this uh, this practice of filing uh, uh, application for opposition, I mean response for opposition. And uh, the, 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 and the responses in regard to, to the refusal notice uh, via email. Uh, this can also help if application uh, as go well could be could be sent uh, via email. Of course, it could reduce the, the cost related to, 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 to time and the travel cost, as I have said. Uh, I, 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 was, I would also recommend uh, official fee. The consideration, though the, the, the official fees of one are not that uh, high, but again, considering the, the, the size of the market of Rwanda and the, the kinds of the startups we have, there should be a, a consideration uh, of these fees uh, where they, they, would pay, they would put uh, a standard fee pay, payable, I mean, pay to be paid by anyone who wants. Um, his IP to, uh, to be protected. But again, there should be a special treatment for startups. Like though there may be a, a standard fee, there, there, there should be also a, a, another fee for small entity or micro entity. Like, like in the US, US has a standard fee, but it has some consideration for small entity and uh, micro entity. So 
uh, big entities or large startup or large entity, they pay a, 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 an official fee different from the one paid by small and micro entities. So of course, this would also help and encourage these startups to get their IP um, registered or protected. Of course, uh, as I have said, series of trademark, though the, the, the law in, 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 under the review, uh, I, I was uh, looking into it, there is no um, procedure for a series of trademark being uh, uh, considered. But if this can be also uh, considered and uh, the, 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 final, uh, the final IP law to be issued, considering uh, the provision uh, con concerning series of trademark, it would help startups to get their IP protected. Uh, also, of, uh, there is also another issue, though East Africa, uh, East African community has uh, an IP policy. Uh, if there would be an establishment of um, a, 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 a regional mechanism, where like if someone in Uganda files an application before uh, Uganda IP registry, then he also gets uh, protection from Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, uh, uh, South Sudan, Burundi. I mean, like this uh, repo or WPO, where through through um, uh, through Madrid protocol, where if one files an application within one uh, designated state, he gets uh, protection from the rest of the, 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 the states. So this would also um, help the startups to, to get their IP uh, registered and protected uh, without incurring uh, much cost. I think that's what I believe they would do be relevant to the topic of today of how the uh, regulations and policies in existence are affecting uh, the, the activities of SMEs. Uh, anybody who has a question uh, uh, would give that question and I'm ready to, to respond to that question. Uh, that's the, the, presentation, the presentation I had uh, for this particular webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Claude. That was very, very exhaustive. I'm certain uh, we've been able to uh, read very quickly uh, uh, and learn about IP in Rwanda. Uh, I'm certain we really run out of time and I want to give some good time to question and answer. So I'll go very quickly to Peter Kea to make his remarks about uh, SMEs and IP in uh, uh, Kenya. Peter, please, the floor is yours. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, oh, my part, I want to just probably make remarks so that I wouldn't want to take that long because we can see from that discussion from the two former panelists that as a region, we are not very different from each other in terms of uh, what is uh, we undergoing and what we are doing and the measures that need to be taken. So I had some very small thing to share, which will form the basis of what I want to talk about. Basically, uh, from my perspective, I just wanted to make my own remarks because uh, <clears throat> really uh, I'm not the regulator, so I can only but share my experiences, but I'm sure from those who are following, uh, they may have one or two things to add on or to actually exemplify the topic. Of course, I am not. Uh, don't have the monopoly of the information. So I mean, I'm actually looking forward to the re robust engagement. So basically, I think our challenges are the same. So what I want to look at is some of them that I've uh, probably encountered in my experience and what I've come across. And most of them, at least you are uh, on the backdrop of uh, 
new regime on this other side of uh, Kenya. And uh, if for those who are following the manifesto and the discussions, it was all about bottom up and someone known as the hustler. So I'm assuming that that is someone who largely falls in this category you're talking about, and that is the SMEs. So we are expecting that as the government uh, continues to, let me call it, settle down, perhaps uh, what they have in store may actually end up being more productive. But you see that is an ongoing discussion and you can only evaluate it as time goes. So like you said, most of the people, especially the so-called hustlers, they need to probably make a living. So for them, it's a question of waking up to just go and do what they, uh, they want to do and so that they can make money and have something to take back home at the end of the day. So some of them actually live from hand to mouth. And so some of these things like IP really, really look like some of those things that you people just read about and have actually no idea what they are. Now, for those ones that are coming up with developments, I'm sure now most of it is heading towards fintech and technology. Uh, from my own engagement and interactions, I realize that most of them are actually in dire need of financing. So all of them, or not really all of them, but like most of them that I interact with are actually coming up with things in the hope that they can get financing, which can be by way of seed or a venture capitalist and so forth. So they can actually then either sell it or get someone to buy them off or partner or so, because most of the developers or the people who are coming up with products in the SME category do not really have the financing part. So you find that they have ideas, but see, ultimately, the one who have money to turn the idea into something tangible is where the IP comes in. Because in terms of thoughts, I can assure all of us that you have so many thoughts in our heads. But until we convert them into something tangible, then it just remains that it is uh, it's a thought. So what I also gathered is that uh, most of them feel like the policies and the framework is a bit unconducive. And you find that uh, there's been a few cases of some people going to challenge what I can call theft by the so-called big players in, in the market. So you find someone maybe was coming up with something, but since he was trying to look for financing, so in the course of pitching, they end up revealing or actually disclosing the entire IP that they had in mind. But like I said initially, because they don't have money, they can't actualize it. So the one who has money will have had the pitch, and of course, some of them will be courteous enough, but others will be crude. And they'll just say, no, we are not dealing with you. Your project is not maybe what does not qualify under our funding model or so forth. So you find that now the so-called big player then ends up taking away that particular product and then develops them as its own because you know them, they have the machinery to do it. So these are some of the challenges and you find that some of the people who really want to mount a challenge on this aspect, you find that they can't really go far because they just don't understand the IP market itself. So you find that people are mis, uh, if I can call it miscommunicating or misadvising, or they just go about it the bad way. So you find that people who have been, uh, the ideas that have been so-called stolen from them, they don't really know how to categorize or classify that particular type of IP into a cause of action that can be sustained. So you find that most of them end up just either lamenting on the media, or I don't know, lamenting quietly, or they just feel like they cannot do anything about it. So that is among the challenges that I was I came across. And then I found that we also don't have a probably a adequate support structure because now those people, they really have no recourse as such. And whenever they have recourse, it is all about venting. So you see someone is venting without any clear expectation. So they can only at worst go to the media and just say, oh, you know, these ones did this, they are not doing this, but Ultimately, without any adequate support structure, you find that nothing will actually bear fruit from it. Then we also have those ones who are especially looking for jobs, so I'm calling them employee-related IT, and they have challenges because you find that most of the young people, especially those who've just come from universities or colleges or sometimes even high school, they really have these many ideas, and some of them are actually looking for a job. So you find that they are willing to give more uh, in terms of what they have in mind for less in relation to employment. So you find that they come somewhere, then they uh, help develop and uh, come up with uh, very good innovations, which end up being taken away from them. But since they were employees, you find that that particular area is not really 
it doesn't really well come out in terms of protection because I know there's a way, as much as you can say underemployment, the IP is a bit, if it's commissioned, but you find that some of them really upfront, you find that the agreements they were signing really had to give them some measure of, uh, if I can call it profit from whatever they were supposed to innovate. But you find that since most of them are just young people who are in employment and you are being employed by some big person, so you find that they really have no recourse and especially when the product ticks up, then they just let go. So it only now becomes an employment related dispute and not really something that was IP related, yet IP forms the core of that particular, if I can call it the company. Uh, something else I know, but uh, I've seen from around here, uh, our young people, or at least many people, they are in for quick returns. So of course in Kenya here, we have the people we call wash wash. I don't think I can uh, translate into any other words, but people want quick money. So when you tell someone that you have to protect your patent and a patent takes probably three, four, five years to protect, nobody wants to wait for that. They want something that can give them money there and then. And that is why when uh, exhibitions are being done or you find that trade fairs have been organized, most people are willing to give, give out their IP in return for almost nothing. Because people, they don't uh, see how this type of protection really helps them especially if it is not converting it into income. Like uh, my two uh, co-panelists said, you find that just the uh, charges for registering some of these uh, IP aspects are quite exorbitant considering the nature of the people you are dealing with. So why would someone want to spend, for example, 50,000 Kenya shillings or even 100, and yet is basically living from hand to mouth? So if an investor comes back and is willing to buy the same product for the same 50 or 100,000, some of these people, especially those in college, they just say, ah, see, I'll uh, okay, sorry, I was moving to slang. I was talking about people who do coding. So they'll say, we'll just come up with another product. After all, I'm uh, developing uh, products here, but they are not giving me money. So I'd rather give it out, even if it's for a loss, than keep it and yet it's not making money for them. So for them, they need for the bread and butter issues. So again, you find that we don't have enough uh, awareness for IP. And sometimes when we even have cases being reported, we have the media which interchanges the use of uh, copyright and instead of trademarks and patents. So you find that people just know we have IP, but they don't really know which type of IP relates to which type of uh, protection. So you find that some people interchange and they don't even know. So if we find that some of these uh, awareness issues that are ending up in the media, have this challenge, then you can imagine the layman, the person on the ground. Because if what is being reported already is a misreport, then you can just, that gives you a picture as to what it is on the ground in relation to how much of IP we are, some of these copyright owners or trademark owners or patent owners are. Then, of course, the, most of them don't have any uh, management or integration of IP. So you find that them, you just develop and move on. You don't really bother whether it's protected or not. And some of them, because I have met some of them, and they blatantly told me to my face, I'd rather go and fight it out in the market than waste my time uh, protecting, yet I will not get money from it. So you find that IP becomes something that is relegated to the periphery, and nobody is really, really keen to invest their time on protection or integration of an IP, so that it comes as a, by the way, as an add-on. So that's why you can find that most of us, when you are trying to engage some of these people as clients, you find that they are not really, really valuing legal services because they think, well, what do I need this for? Because I mean, the lawyers are not giving me money. They are not giving me business. In fact, they won't take money from me. So why should I bother with my effort to do all that? Yet I really don't see the manifestation of it in what exactly I'm doing. So again, it comes with protection and registration costs. Some of it is a bit high. And uh, for those who have done trademark here in Kenya, I'm sure you are familiar with the opposition process. And since we are on the international platform, I wouldn't want to give my own experiences, but let's just say that sometimes it takes a bit long. It takes too long to the extent that now it stops being a benefit to any of the persons who are involved in it upfront. Because remember once opposition pro proceedings start, you can't even continue the registration process. So if the client had uh, probably purpose to launch his products and continue, then they have to suspend that process for an almost indefinite time. 
So most of them, like we said, they need for the business part. So it's cost benefit. So someone says, what is the need for me so that I do this? So you find that that is uh, one of the main challenges that comes up. And uh, personally, I've uh, been a bit reluctant to, to take on opposition matters for almost that reason. Then now you can see the registries are being digitized, especially for the company's registry. So you see, as lawyers, again, our work becomes a bit uh, not necessarily about registration, because then you have to move to something else. Because digitization means it becomes more accessible, and then you find that now people can do it for themselves. But now that only probably applies to those of us who live in the big towns and are a bit exposed. But you find that someone in the village or someone somewhere has no access to any of these systems. So when you find that registration, for example, must be done digitally, then you're introducing a whole new challenge of what exactly they're supposed to do. But I'm just assuming this is a temporary issue because as we move on, the people who are coming up uh, with those SMEs and uh, IP are a bit young people. And nowadays, at least the access to internet and to the mobile phone is becoming more and more. So we really hope that digitization can probably cure the challenge that uh, my colleague there was mentioning about having a centralized office in one place. Because if you digitize the service, then perhaps you don't need any register anymore. And the example I'm thinking about is uh, the movable securities registry, which is literally entirely virtual. Of course, it has its own successes and challenges, but of course, that is not part of the discussion for today. So some people believe that IP is a barrier to accessing technology. Again, it manifests itself in very many ways because, uh, like I said, people look at it. Why should I go to protect something, yet it is not giving me something in return? And on the other hand, I'm the one spending on it. So we really don't have uh, like a proper or an appropriate policy that deals with IP and especially for the SMEs. So of course you have legislation and uh, someone has always been saying that our problem is never the law, but usually the implementation of it. Our constitution has uh, mentioned intellectual property somewhere under the statutes and we have so many acts that really deal with it. But I know this is not uh, a session where we're introducing IP. So I'm assuming I just uh, gloss over that. In terms of uh, what is currently happening, we have uh, the status, startup bill. And this one seeks to tighten the policy control around IP enforcement. And again, this come up, comes about with, uh, of the combination of the parallel IP related acts. Because again, we have the intellectual property bill, which seeks to consolidate this particular act. So once that is consolidated, the main objective then will be to provide a framework that will encourage growth and sustainable technology new entrepreneurship and employment. So we're assuming that once all these things are tabulated and at least aggregated into that one law, while the law may not be perfect as at now, but at least it will be a good starting point because it deals with things that are not there. So we are assuming that the bulk of our, uh, I can call it the population, really now is in that uh, category where most people are trying to be innovative so that they can survive. And again, employment and especially employment to government is becoming very, very restrictive in terms of uh, how many people can be absorbed. So most people have to now look for other ways of uh, surviving, and that can only be through innovation. Because people, again, especially the younger ones, are moving away from things like agriculture, and we also don't have the land, and now with the climate change. So people have to move into something else. So basically, we have the startup bill and the intellectual property bill, and those are the measures that I can think of at the moment that are really something that we can look up to in terms of seeing where we are heading as a country in relation to IP and the SME. We have regulators there, uh, Kenya Copyright Board. We have the Kenya Intellectual Property Institute. That is the bulk of it that deals with trademark patents, utility models, and that. We also have the anti-counterfeit agency. And again, of course, those who have been following what was happening in Kenya the other day, we had uh, that big incident about the China Square and about whether the anti-counterfeit agency and the actions it did in uh, going after some of the products and then having them released. But like that, that is a debate for another forum and another place. I was just mentioning it. So in terms of policy recommendations, the OECD had some in 2011. And uh, like the common thread has been raising awareness about the opportunities offered by IT. Of course, again, they're diffusing the knowledge about the variety of the IP instruments. 
Uh, we have to foster IP education and training and bringing services and expertise closer to the SMEs. Uh, at, at least I saw, I see KIPI, they do some outreach uh, sessions and sometimes they go all the way to the high school students because you better get them when they are still at that stage because once they come out of the market and they don't know some of these things, catching up may be a bit difficult and again, those who have been around longer can easily and uh, very readily poison them to tell them how bad it is so that teaching, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So if we make this IPR system more friendly, then I'm sure the uptake will equally be reflected in that particular aspect of it. And now that you're going regional again, probably we need a cross-border IP coordination and enforcement uh, mechanism. And like uh, my brother there said, maybe we need a system where you file in one country and automatically it covers the whole country because when you are getting strategic investors, especially from outside Africa, they know it's easier for them to come in regionally as opposed to going through maybe country by country. And sometimes you find that our we are at different paces and levels of uh, where we are reached with our laws and policies. I think we also need to improve how we measure the SMEs uh, intellectual assets and so that we can evaluate how they are managed. And what I'm having in mind is that uh, maybe we can look of a ways of having the SME itself through the IP done in a way that it can actually secure financing on its own based on an IP. But to see for us to do that, then we must have a, an objective or at least a standardized way of measuring what that IP aspect is. So as I wind up, again, like I said, the takeaways is that uh, it comes down to the government and the regulatory aspect because those are the ones that uh, set the pace. But that doesn't mean that we wait for the government and regulatory aspect. We can come up with it. We are the practitioners. We are the ones who deal with these things every day. So we can also help and some of this forum like this one actually come in handy for us to exchange knowledge so that we can see where the gaps are so that you can help the government and the regulators to fill them in. Again, cost-benefit analysis, the cost of protecting as against the commercial value of the IP, I mean, that is something that we cannot ignore. So for IP, at least protection to be relevant, then for the investor or for the innovator, they have to see why it is not costly for them to consider it. Because like I said, the people have encountered before, they are just telling me outright that they don't see the need for going through this registration, yet they would have been making money instead. But since you are lawyers now, we need to look more of our role as practitioners. So we see, are we just service providers or are we supposed to be enablers? Or are we supposed to be actually stumbling blocks? We will just be there and be overtaken by events. So I think maybe we should uh, take a greater role when we are doing our work so that we facilitate or at least when the regulators and other stakeholders are doing some of these activities to increase awareness, we be incorporated in them so that we now know so that we move uh, on the same page. And again, for those of us who do advisories, uh, whenever you're advising most of your clients, at least let them have an IP uh, strategy for whatever they are doing, including for their future. So I want to stop at that point so that we, because I can also see the timing and uh, so that we can have at least time for question and answer. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter, and uh, all the discussant, very happy for being on point. Of course, we've run out of time. I will uh, ask, uh, for the, may, the members to make their comments, uh, their questions, as we have only 30 minutes left and uh, we can get the response from the panelists. You can also send your questions to the inbox or the chat box. I will be able to read it out. Uh, those who are able to raise their hands, please let us know. Okay, as we wait for those to raise their hands, there's a question in the inbox. What's the determinant of a small enterprise and a medium enterprise? 
I think that varies from uh, country to country. Uh, we shall have, uh, shall have. I think each each uh, panelist from each country, are letting us know the position from the different jurisdictions. As we wait for uh, questions from from the from the listeners. Okay, we, 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 there's no one immediately. Um, can we have uh, an answer Excuse from? Me. Yes. Did I hear someone? Can I give my answers in regard to how uh, small and medium enterprise are classified? Absolutely. Or, Please go ahead. Okay. Um, in Rwanda, small startup um, uh, evaluated. I mean, or are classified basing on the, I mean, generally startups are, uh, are classified based on the number of employees they employ and the, 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 the number of uh, the sales they make, like the, the annual turnover. Uh, for small startup, which is a uh, small enterprise, uh, this enterprise to be classified as such, it has to be an enterprise employing from three to 20, uh, employees with an annual turnover less than 20 million, but which is equal to to to, to 1 million. Uh, I mean, from 1 million to 20 million. Uh, whereas a, a, a medium startup, it's that uh, startup company which employs between 21 to 100 employees with an annual turnover uh, uh, from 20 million Rwandan francs to 500 million Rwandan francs. As I said before, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, currently, uh, the, the one dollar equals to 1,100 uh, Rwandan francs. So for small startup, uh, the, the, the annual turnover uh, would be uh, 20,000 USD, whereas uh, medium startup would be uh, 500,000. Uh, USD. So that's how Rwanda classify um, small and medium startup or small and medium enterprise. Okay, th 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 thank you very much, Jean Claude. Um, um, Lillian, what's the what, what's the determinant for an SME? Uh, thank you so much, Edwin. I think in Uganda uh, we are we classify SMEs to be to have a, a below 20 employees. So if a business has below 20, I think uh, that one can be determined to be under an SME. Just that I, in my perspective, for me, I look at, uh, I can differentiate between uh, an, a small enterprise and a medium enterprise, looking at a small being a startup and a medium is the one which has which has already started, which is already ongoing, already in business. So I look at that one a bit different from a small, a small one. For the small enterprise, the one which is just starting, but uh, at least we categorize SMEs to be one, as in small and medium, to be one, having employees below 20. So for the income, I'm not so sure about that one, but at least for the employees, just like in Rwanda, what Jin has shared, uh, you should have employees below 20 to be under SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, response. Um, I, I don't see any other question, but uh, I would employ anybody here to let us know. Uh, at the beginning of the, of the webinar, I did ask if any of you is aware of the progress or if there's any position on uh, on uh, the policy at the uh, regional level, is there such a thing as the East African intellectual property policy? Would anyone be able to educate the members about existence and what progress they have? Peter, are you aware of anything? 
At least I'm not aware of anything formal because most of it, unless we are covering it under the trade related aspects, because that is where the focus usually is. So that's how I was saying that when you are doing our IP policy, perhaps the strategy should be covering, because like I can see, IP may not necessarily be a standalone, uh, I can call it project. So we need to start learning how to hinge it on something else. And the best part we would do for me would be if we are to tag it alongside maybe trade. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the response. Um, I, I don't see any other res any other question from the members. Is there, is there any, just one last call? We've done over one hour and uh, 15 minutes. We just have only 10 minutes to close. I would be happy to have one last question and we close. Uh, Peter. I mean, uh, Edwin. Yes, yes, uh, to, to, to add on what Peter said, uh, I, as, as I were uh, uh, looking, whether we do have an, an, an East African community IP policy, I also found the one with uh, trade related aspects. So we don't have that standard on uh, ES IP policy. Okay, uh, well, I thank you very much. I asked because uh yes most of all ip laws and policies seem to be similar but there are few disjunctures and uh, i don't know whether it is important that we harmonize some of them and have something that guides us as a region uh, is, is that something that would be of interest or that would help us us here in east africa yeah indeed that would be helpful as we have been uh, recommending that there should be a regional mechanism uh, where the protection from one country uh, equals to the protection uh, from another country. That can be done when the roles are, are, are harmonized. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. We also have uh, an insight from Joshua Serunjoji. Uh, who says, according to Uganda Investment Authority, uh, SMEs in Uganda are classified based on their number of employees and annual turnover. They're divided into three categories, micro, small, and medium. Micro enterprises have up to four employees and a turnover of less than 10 million. Small enterprises have five to 49 employees and a turnover of 10 to 100 million. Medium enterprises have 50 to 100 employees and a turnover of 100 to 360 million. Yes, thank you very much, Joshua, for that insight. Um, um, I'll just make one more last call. We have only uh, eight minutes left uh, before I can get uh, the last, last comments from uh, our panelists. Um, well, I, I don't, no one is, uh, is responding, but for those who have been in our inbox, thanks a lot. I'd want to get uh, uh, the parting shots from uh, Lillian and then uh, uh, Jean-Claude and then Peter in that sequence and we, we close this webinar. Lillian, your uh, parting shot. Uh, thank you so much, Edwin. And I was also like to, to take this opportunity to thank the East African Law Society for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, train uh, meeting you have organized because I think it's very insightful if we, uh, we keep coming up to discuss more, more of our intellectual property and how it can be of support to our SMEs because for me I believe and I trust that uh, this is the only way to go and uh, if you could uh, try to find out you will get to understand that most of the developed countries have so much developed just because of intellectual property. So if even East Africa, we can embrace IP and try to, and to simplify it to our people who are into business, I think there would be much more benefit because uh, to, uh, to a, a larger uh, 
I believe that uh, many people would benefit more in intellectual property if they could understand the value of intellectual property, if they could understand the different intellectual property assets they do own. Because basically, uh, most of the people who are into business only look at uh, the, um, the finished product. They look at uh, the product which they can touch. Uh, let me give an example of a bottle of water. So if someone is a manufacturing you always consider that finished bottle, the water itself, not considering the intangible assets which are within that bottle. Because if we are to utilize the intellectual property assets, I think uh, um, uh, our countries will grow compared to how we have okay. been. So as practitioners, uh, let's go back to the drawing board and see how we can support uh, the SMEs to understand intellectual property. Let's go back to the drawing board and see how we can uh, make a difference uh, in, our, in our countries by illustrating how intellectual property work, by illustrating how people can benefit out of um, intellectual property aspect. Because at the end of the day, this is what we need for our SMEs to grow, and this is what we need to make our laws work because if we, do not, if we are supporting and not understanding the benefits then it will be useless for us to draft the different policies it will be uh, difficult for them to understand uh, the, the IP laws itself so uh, what am I saying here let's create awareness at all levels if it means going to the communities going to the ground to speak IP in the language people understand, let's go and do that. If it means speaking intellectual property in the local language, let's try to uh, simplify intellectual property for these SMEs. Because the micro or the small enterprises we have today are the ones which are going to grow into big enterprises tomorrow. So let's make sure that we put intellectual property to work practically, but we, 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 are, we move out from the theory bit of it and put IP to practical through seeing the results and uh, getting success stories out of SMEs by using intellectual property. Thank you for, the, uh, for, for this opportunity you have given me. And I also love to thank uh, the, my fellow panelists for uh, as in, uh, giving out their knowledge uh, the organizers of this and also the, the moderator. Thank you so much and I wish you the best. Thank you. Okay, uh, one last remark from Sean Claude. In just uh, one thank minute. You. Uh, thank you very much, Edwin, and thank you, the East Africa Law Society, for inviting me to participate through this webinar. It was indeed uh, a good opportunity to share. IP experience as far as uh, Rwanda is concerned. Uh, as we have all uh, put forward, there is an issue of IP awareness. Many SMEs are not aware of IP. They don't know what is IP, what is in it for, for them, how can it be uh, used to, to, to make them generate um, more income. So that's uh, the, the main issue we were able to, to identify. So I would recommend that um, the SMEs uh, should be, uh, uh, I mean, should develop a, a, a culture and a, a spirit of approaching the lawyers to, to get help. Yes, we understand they don't understand the, the IP rules. Of course, even if they, they would uh, get an understanding through uh, the similar webinars, there should be a continued uh, IP awareness for them to have a, a vast knowledge in IP. They shouldn't also be uh, fearing to approach the lawyers to, to, to get assisted. Many lawyers are there to, to help them to know uh, the, 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 the IP and what they can do uh, to generate income from the, their, I, uh, uh, their creations. Uh, Lastly, I would uh, just appreciate uh, the participant for sharing the knowledge. Um, of course, we are in the East African community, so it's indeed uh, a good opportunity to hear 
uh, our, our differences because uh, it's from our differences that we are we are able to improve we are able to formulate um, policies pro programs and others which uh, help us to, to to flourish in whatever we are doing uh, great appreciation also to to the attendants uh, who have come to to listen to us as we are sharing the IP knowledge I believe that um, as I previously said that IP awareness is the the most thing to be done now uh, I, I would be happy also to to hear or seeing more IP uh, webinars uh, like this happening to help uh, SMEs understand the IP and what they can uh, generate from using the IP. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Jean-Claude. Peter, the last word and we move on. I also want to thank uh, at least the ELS, the organizers, the moderator Edwin, and my co-panelists Lillian and Jean-Claude for this robust discussion and at least uh, for organizing this type of session, at least a regional IP one, so that we can then keep the discussion going. So I don't forget the ones who have been attending because again, we would just be speaking to ourselves if there was no attendees and then it will not benefit because you are speaking what you already have in our heads. So it's good to always put it out there because again, what is the use of having knowledge which you don't share. Uh, just on the M, uh, the micro and small medium, at least for Kenya, we have an authority, the micro and small enterprises authority. And like the rest said, it is all about the numbers and turnover. So I think uh, for Kenya, the micro may be less than 10, then the small may be between 10 and 50, that is employees, and the medium may be between 50 and 99. So as uh, advocates, I think we have our role to play we should not just be docile uh, participants with the law, uh, but also be active uh, participants so that we, we should not be like, a, I don't know which is the best example. Is it a police station or a, or a doctor who only the sick people go to see them and doctors don't come out to tell the people about some of these things. So for us, I think we have uh, both the ability to sit and wait, but also the ability to go out and engage so that we can now seek more of those who need our services by also opening their minds. It's very painful for you to see someone being taken advantage of, yet as an advocate, there's something you could actually have done about it. So, so that we don't start the debate again, I think uh, let me leave it at that. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And we look forward to many more such sessions in future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, panelists. Uh, I'll also like to thank you for the Tropical Society, but most of all the attendees for giving their time to um, join us. I'm very grateful uh, to the panelists as well and everybody who has given his time. Uh, we have uh, eight minutes to go. I'm very happy that we have kept time and I would wish to thank everybody. Uh, if there isn't any uh, communication from Secretariat, Gabriel, any communication? If I close this. Oh, okay. Um, Gab Gabriel seems not to be uh, available, but uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, we, we keep thanking you for attending this webinar series. We'll definitely have very many more. Uh, this period is taking note, and I uh, hope to see you next time when we invite you over to join us. Have a wonderful weekend and uh, thanks a lot again to everybody.